Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, a light that points the way to that amazing banquet feast that you are preparing for us in heaven itself. Lord, as we look at this parable today, a challenging one at the least, help us to see that that invitation is there and that through your spirits working in our hearts, we move forward knowing what it is that awaits us in love. And we thank you for that all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, during these fall months, we're working our way through a series of short stories called parables that Jesus shared with people. Now put another way, a parable is a short story with a purpose. There's a, a very clear point that Jesus is sharing with the disciples and with us today. Now today, we're going to ask an important question through this challenging and I would even say troubling parable of the wedding banquet. Why should we come to the banquet? Jesus tells a story today of a king who prepared an elaborate wedding banquet for his son. Now, everyone loves a wedding, right? Usually, weddings are exciting quite memorable days. Invitations will come in the way mail weeks, if not months, before it even happens. You might get a, a save the date notice. You need to check your calendar out and figure out, okay, is this going to work for my family or not? Then you get to send in that RSVP, the one that says, yeah, you can count on us being there for the wedding or no, I'm sorry, it's just not going to work. Back in 2011, Prince William and Kate Middleton were married. The wedding invitation, the formal one, was what you see here on the screen. Now, what would you have done if you would have received a formal invitation to this wedding? Would you have said, nah, I'm just too busy to go. I have too much other stuff stuff on my plate right now. My guess is that most of you, maybe not all, but most would have done anything you could to find your way to London for the big event. So in today's reading from Matthew 22, a king is having a royal wedding for his son. It is truly a once-in-a-lifetime event. Now, to back it up a little bit, this parable was told during that first Holy Week. So as Jesus is sharing this story, he knows that by the end of the week, he's going to be dead on a cross, dying there for you and for me. It's also important for us to know what set up this parable. Just before this, in Matthew chapter 21, verse 45, it says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. You can just sense the tension starting to build here. The religious leaders wanted Jesus dead. Nothing less would do. He was a threat to their power. He was a threat to their lives. So with that background in mind, we get to this parable in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables. The kingdom of God is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So similar to what you might see here, the palace is spectacular. The king actually issued three invitations to those who were invited. You heard it in the, in the parable itself from Matthew. First was probably what we call a save the date. The second was an invitation saying, okay, now it's time to come to the banquet. The third, I don't know if I'd call an invitation so much as a blunt reminder. Why aren't you here? Why have you not come to the wedding banquet? Jesus then tells us that the invited guests thought they were too busy to show up. 
I don't know about you, but if by some weird twist of fate I were invited to a royal wedding, I'd probably figure out a way to get there somehow. So, instead, you know, the invitation's been out, the wedding is ready, but the people refuse to come. Who is it that actually refused to come in this parable? It's the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They should have been primed. They should have been looking forward to this incredible banquet. But they refused. They had been invited over and over and over again by all the prophets from the Old Testament. But when the wedding feast of the Son of God came to be, when Jesus appeared on the scene, they don't have time for him. They rejected the invitation. And it doesn't end with that. Matthew 22, 8 and beyond continues. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. So, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you see. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. That's kind of interesting. So now the wedding hall has been filled to the rafters. No longer was it the self-important people. No longer was it the so-called religious people. No longer was it the Pharisees or the teachers of the law. The good church people, as it were, who were invited. The servants went out and found anybody they could find so the wedding hall is filled with absolutely unexpected guests. Now today, we do understand how Jesus has opened wide the kingdom of heaven to not only good religious people or to faithful Jews. He's opened it to Gentiles, non-Jews. That, by the way, is you and me. Heaven is opened to the good and the not so good sinful people, those who look to Jesus in faith to forgive their sin. Now, you might remember that Jesus received criticism after criticism in his ministry because he dared to eat with sinners and sit down with them. Oh no. <laughs> but then there's a strange twist in this parable in verse 11 which makes it even more challenging. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It sounds pretty harsh to me. I mean, well, he just didn't have the proper clothes. Martin Luther, the founder of our particular tribe of the Christian faith, once preached on this text. He began the sermon with these words. This is a terrifying gospel. Whoa. You see, we want Jesus always to be happy, to be joyful. We want his words always to be welcoming. But do you remember what the king did to those who were invited first, who then failed to show up? He killed them and ravaged their town. And then this guy who was simply wearing the wrong clothes shows up and gets thrown out of the party. A terrifying gospel, indeed. Okay, so what do we do with all this? What does this mean for you and me? By the way, that's a good Lutheran question. It seems pretty harsh. So how about we begin with this thought? Sometimes we think of the gospel like this. God wins in the end. Everything's going to turn out okay for everybody. But is that really the gospel? Simply put, the gospel is this, about as simple as you get. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but will have eternal life. And despite these gracious, inviting words of love, many people in this world say, nope, to that gracious outreach, that gracious caring attention. And the other thing is that if people don't want to come, he allows them to stay away. But our Lord keeps inviting people. C.S. Lewis called that God, interesting term here, the great hound of heaven. Constantly seeking after, constantly inviting, constantly wanting people to come. But they do not come on their own terms. Rather, they, they do not come clothed in their own self-righteousness or self-importance. But instead, we go to the banquet empty-handed. Back in Jesus' day, it was very common in fancy weddings such as this, and Jesus is talking about, for the king to provide clothes for those who were invited. Why would he do that? So that everyone there had a brand new set of clothes with which to enjoy the wedding feast. They'd all be the same. Now, you need to remember, in Jesus' day, festivals like this usually went on for a week. But this particular man comes in, and he wants to wear his own clothes, not the ones provided by the king. So where's Jesus in this story? Well, he is the son for whom the wedding feast has been thrown. There are some who say that in the week Jesus told the story, well, Jesus has to be the one with the wrong wedding clothes. I don't think so. But the reality is that that very week, Jesus would be stripped of his clothes. He would be tied up, beaten, bound, tossed out to a place called Golgotha. Why? So you wouldn't have to go through this. In that great exchange, he now literally clothes you. He gives you his clothes of righteousness, grace, and love. Jesus experiences all of this in your place. So you don't have to. He becomes the fulfillment of what was shared in Isaiah 61, verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. So you and I have literally been clothed, arrayed in a robe of his righteousness. We have been graciously invited to the Lamb's wedding feast in heaven that has no end. My prayer is that we would not want to go in our own righteousness, but in Jesus's. When we hear that gracious invitation, the Spirit leads us to come empty-handed, ready to be served and be loved, ready to celebrate at the glorious feast of that kingdom which He has prepared for us. So briefly, what are the key takeaways from this challenging parable? First, the king's invitation is for everyone. It's not just for good church people or people who somehow think, I've got my act together. It's for the good and the bad. Sinners, one and all. The king's invitation is for everyone. Second, sadly, some who are invited will refuse to come. Others will simply ignore the invitation as though, well, it's not for me. There may be people in your own life who have heard the invitation of Jesus. There may be friends, there may be family members or co-workers who say, no, it's not for me, or I'm not invited, I'm too busy to respond. Third, some will try to come on their own terms, or on their own righteousness or wisdom. Some depend on themselves rather than follow the righteousness of Jesus. Remember, it's in Him alone that we're clothed with grace. Fourth, 
we come clothed with the clothes the King, our Lord himself, gives us the clothes of love and grace that cover our lives. And there's a fifth one as well. Jesus is sending you. If his invitation is for all, it's up to his servants to share that invitation. For those people in your life who for some reason have not responded to the great and glorious invitation of the king, you and I as servants of the king are called to extend an invitation. Now it may take multiple invitations until some will come to the king and celebrate the joy of the banquet. The spirit works in different ways. So why should I? Why should we come to the banquet? We're invited by the king to experience his love in full. And what an amazing love it is. Forgiveness. Life to the full. Being whole with our gracious king at the unending feast in heaven itself. Come. The feast is ready. Come to the feast. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us looking forward to that banquet feast in heaven. Amen.